driver's door, ran out the side of the car, across the front of it, and jumped right off the side of the bridge in front of me. The only people that really pulled over were truckers. He said, we're going to Hodge, and he didn't slow down. He went across the median onto the oncoming traffic, but where they could see him coming, they just got out of the way. I noticed this plane was really low. He went right in front of us, hit the fence, and it spun around. You know, 30 seconds more, he could have hit us. And I went around that truck, and a guy stepped out from behind the truck and threw a piece of wood, and it shot through my window just like a spear and stuck in the back of the cab of my truck. That's probably one of the stranger things I've seen. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to Hammer Lane Legends. I am your host, Tony Merkel, and alongside of me is my dad, Brian Merkel. And we have a wild and crazy experience for you today. But before we get into that, you can shoot us an email if you want to be on the show and share your wild, crazy experiences from the road. All you got to do is shoot us an email at hammerlanelegends at gmail.com or go to the website, Hammer Lane Legends. Hit the contact section and you can reach us that way as well. Either way works for us. Just get a hold of us. Now, today we have Sam coming on the show, and Sam is going to be sharing some of his wild experiences that he had overseas as a civilian driver for our military. These are guys that we don't ever hear about, but they're very real, and they have some very real stories. This is going to be a fantastic show for you guys. Don't get too distracted while you're driving. Just sit back, hit the cruise control, and listen in for the next hour and a half. Sam is going to be sharing some wild things. Let's go. today we got a great guest joining us dad i i'm telling you dad when i saw this email i was very impressed because there was a lot of detail in fact uh, our guest sam he actually sent this email over and it was really long and i said to him i said bro this is so long i'm not gonna have time to read it can you some can you kind of kind of cut, <laughs> cut it down for me <laughs> and uh he, he did and i'm just really excited about this and uh sam how you doing man i'm good real good thanks for having me on that's great to have you sam yeah, so Sam, uh, I'm excited to talk to you for many different reasons. So I love talking to people who uh, served in our military. I got tremendous respect for those people. Um, it's something that for the longest time, I regretted not doing myself. I, I almost went into the military right out of high school. It was like the height of the 9-11 stuff. We just came off of that. And uh, I was an angry young kid and ready to go and you know fight for my country. And I just got so much respect for people who did. So I just wanted to up front say, say thank you very much for, for serving in our military. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, I want to make one thing clear. I, I was a civilian in Iraq. I, ah, okay. We lived bled sometimes died with the military but we were all all civilians we we're just truck drivers that went over there to to do a job that's amazing it is amazing and it, and, and and that in and of itself deserves a thank you because you, you you went and did a job that that you weren't even asked to do you know, you know what i mean like it wasn't like you had signed up for the military this is something that you did extra this is something that you went above and beyond and 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 served for us that, in, in, yeah you know, i appreciate so that a lot i of- really appreciate that that is really really cool yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, Sam, um, along those lines, uh, you have some interesting stories from over there being a civilian driver. I didn't know what that meant when you said civilian driver. Now it makes more sense. Uh, but after we're done talking with you, Sam, on this show, we're actually going to do another interview with you over on the Confessionals podcast, which is the first podcast I ever started. And um, we're going to talk more about your paranormal experiences because the Confessionals is a show where people come on and share their personal experiences with the strange, unusual, paranormal. Uh, we at the Merkel household are very much believers in the other side of life. Very and much so. um, we enjoy talking to people like that. So I just want to let the audience know that after we're done with this interview, if you loved hearing from Sam and you think me and my dad did a decent job, you might want to go check out the Confessionals podcast because Sam's episode is going to air simultaneously with this episode. Uh, now, now that we got all the uh, stuff, the the, the public announcements, yeah, yeah, the public announcements out of the way and stuff. 
Um, I want to kind of hand the show over to you, Sam, and I want you just to start wherever you feel comfortable. Let's just start off actually with what got you in the mindset? What what happened in your life that led you to going overseas to become a civilian driver? Uh, and then from there, share with us some of these experiences you had, man. Okay. Well, I, I grew up driving trucks been a part of my whole life. I grew up in Idaho, the potato capital of the world, real big at, in agriculture. And I started driving 10 wheelers out in the field under the potato combines when I was 13 years old. So we would drive 10 wheelers, load the potatoes under the combine, then take them to the spud cellar. And I did that for a couple years. And then I was probably 14, 15 years old. And I worked on a, a ranch and we just got done uh, with the hay crop. So we had a bunch of hay bale that we needed hauled in the, boss came over and he asked me if we had an old uh, Peterbilt, like a 1980s Peterbilt, and it had two 40-foot trailers hooked to it. And he said, you know how to drive that? And I said, I don't even have a driver's license. And he said, well, I didn't ask you that. I asked if you knew how to drive it. <laughs> so that was my first <clears throat> job driving big trucks. I was 14, didn't even have a license, and I was pulling two 40-foot trailers hauling hay. So. I did that for several years working on the farm. When I got old enough, I started looking for a over the dro over the road job so I could make some more money and went around to the different guys, different companies around here that you know, ran over the road, and they all told me I had to get would have to ride with a trainer for two weeks, you know, to get because I'd never had any over the road experience and. I didn't want to do that. I wasn't interested in sharing a truck with anybody. And I, I finally met a guy. He had a little potato processing plant that was family run and they had maybe 20 trucks that would haul their product out. And then we get loads coming back. And I asked him if he'd give me a job driving over the road. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I've never driven over the road. Would you need to train me? And he said, no, we got a load going to California and you're getting to learn a hell of a lot on your first run. So <laughs> that's that was, amazing. <laughs> that's how I started driving over the road. And I did that for several years until I got married. And I didn't want to do that when I was married. So I moved to Oregon to go to school. And I drove local around Portland for a company called Stuart Style while I was going to school. And the school I went to was pretty, it was going to take a lot of money to finish. I had gotten a private pilot's license when I was 19, and I wanted to be a professional pilot. And to get all the flight hours, it, it takes a lot of money. So I knew I wouldn't make enough money driving trucks. <clears throat> and I heard one of the guys talking about his cousin who was over in Iraq driving trucks as a civilian and he was, he was making quite a bit of money. And I have a wonderful wife who supports me in every stupid thing I want to do. And she supported me in going over to Iraq, working for a year and making money so I could finish school. And that's how I got into driving truck overseas. It was real hard at first because <clears throat> They had hundreds of applications every week on the internet. The company was KBR, and I applied to every single one of those job announcements, but I never heard back from anybody. And it turns out they they like people with military experience, people who'd been in the military. So they weren't really interested in me, but the semester ended. I decided I was going to go, and I flew to Houston to their headquarters and walked in and told them I was there to go to Iraq and drive trucks. And they hired me. Two weeks later, I was I was overseas. We flew into Baghdad. And then we went to our different bases. There was about 50 new truck drivers with me that went to Anaconda, which is about 
60 miles north of Baghdad. And that's where we finished our <clears throat> training in country. We had about two weeks of classes. And I wanted to tell you when I got there, it was hot. I got there in July, and I have a picture of the thermometer in the shade, and it's 134 degrees in the shade where we were at. And one of the first days there, I took my boots off at the end of the day, and my socks and the top layer of skin came off both my feet. They cooked Jeez. because it was so hot. So I had to go to the PX, get in <clears throat> a pair of desert boots with the vents in them, new pairs of socks, and uh, bottles of foot powder. And I'd, I'd have to change my socks every two or three times every day, put foot powder in them, put fresh socks on until my feet healed up because they just cooked inside my boots. Wow. But That's crazy, man. That's, yeah. that's I mean, talk, <laughs> talk about a baptism by fire. You know, like you're being introduced to a whole new environment, a whole new world, and and you're cooking your feet. Like that's that's literally insane. That it, is that it is. was. <laughs> so and it. Go ahead. That was. It was. It was insane, but it was. That's what made it exciting too. I was pretty excited to be there. I've always had a lot of respect for the military, and to be there and. And help them. That was something I was proud to be doing, and I was. It made it exciting, the different culture and everything too. So. Yeah, absolutely, and and I, I can imagine I can feel that excitement when I hear your story already because it's like the idea of it's like a whole it's a journey. We're men, we're guys here talking, and we understand that that feeling of just uh, wanting to uh, experience the the journey of life, and you doing what you did. It, like you in the moment know you're embarking on a journey that you're going to be telling stories for the rest of your life and clearly you are and so um <laughs> before you get any further i just wanted to ask you i know i'm going to forget later actually two things let me just clarify one you went to houston uninvited and just walked in and said i'm here for a job <laughs> is that is... right well it was even it was even more than that i I'd, I'd moved my wife to Utah where she wanted she wanted to go to school there and I'd quit my job quit school we moved to Utah and I still hadn't heard back from the company and I took my last three hundred dollars and flew to Houston and said I'm ready to go to work so it was all or nothing we were in wow. we were in so that's incredible man that's incredible it, it, it's like this is the kind of stuff that builds life stories and I, I I'm already just Super excited to hear your story. Uh, and my other question before you go any further is, uh, you mentioned about going through training. I think you said for two weeks when you got over there. What was the training like? Was it kind of similar to like a boot camp or was it totally different? Like you were boot camping for driving over there, not really physically, but more learning the the maps and how to read signs and all that kind of stuff. So the training was a lot of uh, what what we could expect out there because it was so completely different from anything you've ever done before. So it was a lot of a uh, classroom PowerPoints. Uh, they taught us what the what was going to happen when we went out on the road. The IEDs, the improvised explosive devices, uh, V beds, the car bombs. Uh, they they pretty much told us how they were going to try to kill us for two weeks. So they everything we could expect. The small arms, mortars, RPGs, mines, everything you can think of, they would find a way to use that against us. And then we had to learn convoy procedures. So <clears throat> every convoy would have 20 trucks, 20 of our trucks. The first truck would have a convoy commander and his driver. And then we'd have 20 or 19 other trucks, then a bobtail, which was in the very back. And he had all the tools and equipment to change tires and pull trucks home if we needed to. He would also pull uh, drivers out of trucks if they were injured and couldn't get out of the truck. So we had to learn all that. 
And a typical convoy, like I said, was 20 trucks, and then we had five military gun trucks spread throughout the convoy. And our contract with KBR, we always had U.S. escorts. So we'd run with the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the National Guard, but it was always a U.S. military escort that went outside the wire with us. Okay, so and then real, real quick on that point, I this is all new to me, Sam. I, I, this is fascinating. Uh, you just said that with your contract with KBR, that you always had U.S. escorts. Does that mean that there's other contracting companies that don't have that in a contract that they're out there without an escort? There wasn't other companies that didn't have escorts. That would just be suicide. That's what I thought. But so. there were. There were. Oh, go ahead. I was just say so. So it was kind of kind of a standard thing that they that they always went out with a, with an escort, which is what I would hope they would do. Yeah, every everybody. I mean, it was a wild west over there when I when I got there, and everybody. I mean, everybody's packing guns, and you didn't go anywhere outside the wire without firepower. You you know that that'd be the last they heard of you. But our contract with KBR was always U.S military escorts which meant that we had their support they they could call in help qrf which is a quick reaction force that would patrol out there and we could call them in to help us if we needed it but some of the other companies that <clears throat> were tcn's third country nationals which was uh, guys from africa a lot of pakistanis and they would go over there and drive truck too, but they had TCN escorts as well. So they didn't have all the all the bonuses that we had of running with the U.S. military because it'd be harder for them to get air support and things like that. So as far as that went, we we were pretty blessed to be with the U.S. military all the time. So another training. We learned all that. We learned all of our convoy procedures and what to do when we were attacked. And and then we had to learn to drive the trucks because they were trucks like we'd never seen before. We had, we drove Mercedes Benz and those, I love those trucks. They're the toughest trucks I've ever driven. They had no airbags. They were all springs. They were cab overs. And they, because they were springs, we did, you know, you didn't have to worry about tearing the suspension out of them. And some of the stuff we did over there was just crazy. But we had to learn to drive them, and they had uh, four gears that you split. So eight gears, and then you'd shift the, push the shifter over to the right, and then you had four more gears that you split. So it was basically a 16-speed. And they were tough, powerful trucks. We'd We'd usually run, well, I looked at a bill of lading once, and I had 107,000 pounds on the truck, and that wasn't counting the truck. That was just the wow. the cargo I was hauling. So, oh, my word. That, and that's incredible. So we, <clears throat> Go ahead, Sam. So we, uh, then after you got done with training, you go on a ride along with the, an experienced driver, and he would drive out on the mission tell you the you know all the try and teach you something what to, while you're out there you'd go unload and come back to base and then you would drive so we called that our ride along and after you drove back on your ride along then you were qualified you were a, a kbr convoy truck driver and they just sent you out my first mission was from anaconda to Baghdad International Airport and I was scared to death and they always put the new guys in the back of the convoy so if they mess up they didn't affect anybody else or put anybody else in danger so I was truck 19 and we drove from Anaconda to Baghdad <clears throat> unloaded and I didn't know it at the time but we shouldn't have gone back because it was too late We'd, we'd run at night when there wasn't a lot of traffic and 
we got delayed and it, it was morning and there was, you know, kind of rush hour in Baghdad and we should have stayed on that base and left the next night. But for some reason we pushed and we were right in Baghdad traffic. Everything from a Mercedes Benz to a, a donkey cart, you know, on the road. And we couldn't get up any speed. It was hard to keep the convoy together. And every time you build up speed, then you get in another traffic jam and have to slow down. And I thought, man, it's going to take forever to get back to Anaconda. And we got up a little speed again, but I could see up, up ahead that there was another traffic jam. And I thought, oh, here we go again. We're going to have to slow down. But the convoy commander said, <clears throat> he said, we're going Haji. And he didn't slow down. He went across the median onto the oncoming traffic, which was just as heavy as the traffic on our side. But where they could see him coming, they just got out of the way. And we never slowed down again until we got back to Anaconda. So that's what we call going Haji. You would just jump across the median onto the other side of the freeway where you're going against traffic. And you could actually go a lot faster against traffic because they could see it coming and they get out of the way. Well, we were almost back to Anaconda on that very first mission, and we went around some trucks that were parked, some local Iraqi trucks. And I went around that truck, and a guy stepped out from behind the truck and threw a piece of wood up in the air. And it was a three by three by five foot long piece of wood and it shot through my window just like a spear and stuck in the back of the cab of my of my truck. So that was my first mission. I had that guy throw that piece of wood at my head. Went right through the windshield of my truck. When we got back to base they they said, Well that new guy's pretty tough and that was my my handle the rest of the time I was over there was tough. So wow, everybody had nicknames. I, I worked with guys for three years over there that I consider my brothers and I have no idea what their names are because everybody had handles that we used and we never used our real names. So was that strategy by not using your real name? We, we were taught that by the military because you didn't want to give them any information that you might be able to use that they might be able to use against you. So we, we wouldn't take personal information outside the wire with us, like uh, driver's licenses or passports or stuff like that. And we didn't, we didn't use our names just for OPSEC, just so they wouldn't get that information and who knows what they would do with it, but it was just procedure over there. Yeah, that's understandable for sure. And I, I, I obviously that it makes all the sense in the world to do that. Uh, so you had so this first day you had some. You said the guy threw it into your truck. Well, he just threw it up in the air, and we were cruising along pretty good, sixty miles an hour. And he just threw it up in the air in front of my windshield, and it turned just like a spear and came right through the right through the windshield, right next to my head. And it was too long to go, it was too long to pull into the cab. So I just drove back to base with the chunk of wood sticking out of the front of the windshield. Wow. And, and that was on purpose though. Is that what you're saying? He did it on purpose. He was just throwing it at, at you guys. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was pretty normal. They, they throw rocks at us. It, the people that didn't like us would try to kill us. The people that were kind of normal would just throw rocks and wood and shit at us. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> you know it, what, what's fascinating is that you know here in the united states we think it's so rough doing our job yeah you know when i hear someone like you i am just fascinated i'm just sitting here fascinated to hear what you went through to hear i mean just it's just fascinating it is just fascinating so that, sam you're you're saying that if they hated you they did things with the intent to kill if they didn't have a problem with you, they're just normal people. They did things that could kill you, but they weren't really trying <laughs> too hard to kill you. Yeah, I think it was just the, I think 
I think it just became normal to them if a truck, you know, an American truck goes by, pick up a rock and throw it at them. Because that, that happened everywhere. And they have them from 90 year old guys down to five year old kids. You know, everybody threw rocks at us. So that was just, just the way it was. Wow. And so you're on your first convoy. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the right terminology, but forgive me if, if I'm not using that right. But you're on your first mission, the first trip, and you're coming back and you guys literally go against traffic because that was actually the express way is what you're saying, right? Because people actually saw you coming and they got out of your way. So you were able to actually move faster. That's correct. Yep. And that was called, we called that going Haji. I don't know where that came from, but that if they got on the radio and said, we're going to hide you, you knew that you were not even going to slow down. You're just going to jump the median onto the other side of the freeway and drive against traffic. So that was, per- that was pretty normal. If they saw something like an IED or something in the road in front of us, we just go hide you, go on the other side of the road and go around it. So that was, that was, yeah, that was all everyday stuff. Wow. So the very first time you went Haji, like, what was it like for you? I mean, like, did you know what Haji meant going into that experience? And like, even if you did or didn't, like, what did it feel like going against traffic in a foreign country where you know you're in enemy territory and you're doing something that we here in the States would consider absolutely insane? Well, I, when I got back from that mission, that first one, I, I felt like it was a video game. That's what I felt like. I felt like it was surreal, that that it wasn't real. It took a while for it to sink in, I guess, is what I'm saying, and get used to that because you're right. You don't you don't drive a truck over here. You'd be put in prison forever if you drove a truck like we did over there. And it just felt surreal. Felt like like I was playing a video game at first, and there wasn't any chance of. So when we went high, gee, I knew what it meant because you'd hear guys talk about it, but you just follow the truck in front of you. And I was in the back of the convoy, so I saw everybody doing it, and you just follow the truck in front of you. You try to stay in their tracks because if they didn't hit a mine and blow up, then you weren't going to either if you stayed in the tracks of the truck in front of you. At that moment, was there ever fear in your mind that you could possibly do something wrong and being the last truck be left behind because you're the last one there. Oh yeah. That was always going through your mind. And I'll tell you something though, the biggest fear that I ever had over there. And I think it was the same for everybody. I had never worried about myself. I worried if I did something wrong and got one of my friends killed, I wouldn't be able to live with that. It would be better. But something happened to me then I did something and made a mistake and, and got one of my friends killed. That was the biggest fear I had over there. Yeah, that makes sense. That really makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. I, I, I can imagine the, the weight that's on your shoulders when you're doing a job like that. And then that, that, that needs to be the forefront of your, in your mind is, is what I'm doing going to affect someone else. Yeah. So after, after, after that mission, I, uh, I got assigned to Anaconda Bulk Fuel. That mission was with the flatbeds. And then I got assigned to Anaconda Bulk Fuel. And we moved a million gallons of fuel every day from northern Iraq to Anaconda. And then it would be spread around. We'd we'd haul that to different fobs, different little bases around Anaconda. But we had two 20-truck convoys going north every day bringing fuel back from a base called Q West and then two empty convoys going up. So we had 80 trucks a day on that road, MSR Tampa going from Anaconda to Q West. And we hauled a million gallons of fuel a day on that road just to keep the military going. And and it was the same road every day. They knew where we were going to be at. It wasn't a surprise to, to them where we're going to be at so we got hit with everything you could think of we we get hit with small arms fire ieds uh rpgs we even had a a truck get hit with the old anti-aircraft missile that they laid on the ground and shot at the convoy 
just anything they could think of. And one of their favorite <clears throat> tricks, I guess call it tricks, but would be to, to hang a 155 artillery round under an overpass because when that went off, it would direct the, all the blast into the truck and there was no way that the truck or the driver was going to survive that. So that was one of the things they they liked to do when they could to us. But I saw a donkey on that route that was laying. He was sitting by the side of the road and he had a cable going through his chest to hold him down and wires coming out of his chest into the ground in front of him. And he was just watching us drive by. So that donkey, we called it in and EOD came out and checked it out. And that donkey had been loaded with explosives while he was still alive. And then chained it or staked to the side of the road. And I don't know why he didn't blow up on us. There must have been a, a short in the wiring or something. But he was filled with explosives while he was alive. and and set to go off on our trucks. Just stuff like that every day is what we saw over there. We, uh, heard, man, <clears throat> go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm, I, I'm sure you can tell this is pretty emotional for me to yeah. talk about I, this. And honestly, man, like I, I'm sitting here in, in shock. And so just take your time. Okay. If I pause, it's just cause the feelings that I'm feeling and, but you know what? I'm glad to share it because when I when I first uh, contacted you, Tony, and told you that you should have somebody from the drove truck over there on your show, I wasn't thinking about myself because I I consider what happened to me pretty normal. And there was guys over there who I consider heroes that I worked with every day, and that's that's who I was thinking about that you should have on your show. Because I don't consider anything I did more than than just normal. And <clears throat> but I know those guys probably wouldn't come on the show or wouldn't want to talk about it. And I'm doing I'm respecting them by coming on and telling these stories because of the the job we did, not my just myself, but everybody needs to get respect for what we did. That need the word needs to get out because people don't even know that we went over and did this. So we would uh, we would take uh, fuel that we took back to Anaconda, and we we'd have other convoys go out and take it to the small bases around. One of those bases was Warhorse, and to get to that base, we had to go over a pontoon bridge over the Tigris River. And I remember we left that morning. And all the cool air would collect down by the river. It was it was weird because you drive through the desert where there's nothing, and then a hundred yards from the river, it'd be like you were in a jungle. And then we'd drive across the river, go through another hundred yards of jungle, and then you're out in the desert again. But one day we were coming down to that bridge where all the cool air collected in the morning, and I was so cold that I had to try three times to turn the heater on on my truck. And I finally got the heater on, and I'm I'm ho hovering over the vents for the heater trying to get warm, and I looked at the outside air temperature gauge on my truck, and it was 98 degrees outside. So we were just used to 130, you know, 125, and when it got down to 98, I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to have hypothermia, but... We got the war horse <clears throat> and unloaded fuel. And then we left the base and turned right. And we went through a little village that had some tall buildings on the left. And I felt, I heard something hit my truck really hard. And I thought it was just somebody throwing a rock because we were used to that. That happened all the time. But I couldn't see anybody throwing rocks. and. So we drove back to Anaconda, and when I parked my truck and got out to look, a sniper had fired from one of those buildings right into the, he just missed the top of the glass on my truck. And the door frame deflected it, 
and I went down and just missed my left leg and went into the seat next to me. So that really shook me up because when they IED'd us, they were trying to kill your truck. At least that's what we said. And this guy was looking at my face in a scope and tried to shoot me in the head. And that really shook me up for a couple of days. But that's one thing that happened to me. And every four months, we'd get to go on uh, R&R. You'd, you'd get to leave for a couple of weeks. They'd buy you a plane ticket wherever you want to go in the world. And that was pretty sacred, and they wouldn't mess with your R&R. So when you got within a week of going on R&R, they wouldn't send you out on mission because you didn't want to take a chance of missing your R&R. And I was coming up on my first R and R. I was gonna leave in a couple of days, <clears throat> but I didn't want to sit around base by myself. So I I asked management if I could go on one more mission before I left on my R and R, and they said yeah. And that mission, we were supposed to leave that morning, go to Key West, and come back. We were supposed to leave early in the morning. And we tried to push once, and the military had trouble with their radios, so we had to come back. We pushed again, and the, there was more problems with, with the truck, so we had to come back. Anyway, that happened three times. And now it was late in the afternoon, and I saw the manager pull up in a pickup, and he told me, he said, he had another driver with him and he said, you're getting too close to your R and R. We're not going to take a chance on you missing it. So this guy's going to take your truck. And I said, okay. He went and made the changes he needed to make on the mission log. And I traded places with that driver and rode back to my hooch with the manager. Well, the next day I was walking around getting the signatures I needed to be able to go on R and R and some guys, a couple guys I knew came up to me and asked if I knew if I'd heard what happened to the driver, the one who had traded with me. And I said, no, I hadn't heard anything. And he had been killed in the truck I was supposed to drive. And if we wouldn't have had those three, uh, returns to base, then I would have been in that truck. And I'm not going to tell you his name. I don't, don't want to do that, but that's something that's bothered me for a long time. Like, yeah, I don't know why he died and I was saved and why all that happened, but just one of the things that happens over there, something that we lived with, we lived with stuff like that every day. And you were there for three years, right? Yeah. Yeah. When I it is just <clears throat> go ahead. I'm, I didn't mean to cut you off. When I, when I went over there, there was, it was in a group of about a hundred drivers, 50 of us went to Anaconda, the rest were spread out. And when I left, I think from that original group, there was maybe four or five of us that were still there. Not because they all got killed, but because they'd gone home and had enough of it. Yeah. And were, were, did you have the opportunity or, or was, I, I guess what I'm asking is, was it a, a, a certain amount of length of contract or were you able to stay as long as you wanted to stay? We, we signed a contract for a year, but all okay. that meant was if you left before your year was up, you weren't ever going to get hired by another contractor again. I gotcha. If you did stay for a year, then you could stay there as long as you wanted after that. But that year just meant if you went home before your contract was up, you weren't going to get hired. They weren't going to put the expense to training you and sending you over there. If you didn't complete your year, they would never take another chance on you again. So, Sure, sure. That, make, that makes perfect sense. It's just fascinating to me that, that you stayed for, for as long as you did, knowing the things that you were seeing, knowing the things that you were putting up with. Uh, you know, we here in the States, we, we don't know. And it, 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 it's exactly what you said earlier. You know, it's good to talk about these things and let people know what it's like 
to do something like this. And this is this is what this show is 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 about is about letting people know what goes on out there, and even in in your case and in in, in what you were doing and and the the service that someone who isn't in the military service is doing for this country to to do the things you did, to see the things you saw, to know the things that you, that you put up with and you did it on a ver- on a volunteer basis for longer than what what you had signed the contract for. It's just I mean my hat's off to you. I mean my hat is just off to you and and I I realize we've only scratched the surface. We're we're just within the first few months of you being there and it, it's fascinating. I am on the edge of my seat listening to these things because I'm just fascinated by it and my hat is off to you for doing what you did. Thank you. Well, one of the one of the constants over there was long hours. We worked we worked more hours than you should have, <laughs> than anybody should have. And I remember uh, we'd be out on a mission, and you would just pray for something to happen to get some adrenaline going through your body to keep you awake. I remember uh, punching myself in the face to try and stay awake, snorting coffee out of MREs to try and stay awake. We'd steal all the Red Bull we could from the cafeteria to try and stay awake when we're out on missions. And we, that was the, so that was kind of the atmosphere. We were all zombies because we worked so much. And then Houston sent over a couple managers to tell us that we were breaking company policy by working too much. And they, had a big all hands meeting and said that we needed to follow DOT rules and only work 70 hours a week, just like, and keep a logbook like you do back in the States. And we were, that was like Christmas to us. We thought we're finally going to get some sleep. We're finally going to get a break now that we can only work 70 hours a, a week. And that was supposed to start on Sunday. So on Sunday, I kept my, log book all of us had a log book and i did two missions to key west so that was by wednesday so by wednesday i had 70 hours already and i thought i'm gonna go back to my hooch and i'm gonna stay there for four days and then i'll start my week over again on sunday that's what the managers that came and told us and i just taken a shower and was getting into bed when I heard my name called over the radio that I needed to get back to the office. So I grabbed all my gear, got dressed, went back to the office and they, there was 20 other guys there and they said that we were going on a mission right then to TQ, which was right on the Syrian border. And and we, (laughs) we said, well, we, we can't because of our log books. And he said, well, just throw your log books in the garbage right there by the door. <laughs> and <clears throat> I said, that's fine. I understand. But I just got back from Q West and I haven't slept for, you know, I haven't slept all day. And he said, well, you'll be all right. And <laughs> so we, we went on that mission to TQ and it took us by the time we got to TQ, it'd been, 30 hours since I'd slept. And I don't know if you guys remember, but in Fallujah, they'd taken a couple con- contractors and pulled them out of their trucks and drug them through the street and then burned them on the bridge. And that happened right as we were going through there. And the Marines were really in a heated fight with the insurgents in Fallujah. And we had to go right through Fallujah on our way to TQ. And so they didn't want us to rest when we got to TQ. They thought it'd be better if we just turned and burned. So I haven't slept for over 30 hours. And they turned and burned us, but they sent us back with Marines. And the Marines wanted to use us as bait to dry out the insurgents. So instead of running as hard and fast as we could, the Marines would drive... 20 miles an hour to make us fat, slow targets and hopefully somebody take a shot at us and then they could go, go hunt them down. And that's exactly what happened. We got in an ambush and the Marines took us to a, an area off the side of the road, left us there with one gun truck while the others went and hunted down these 
guys who'd shot at us. And they they got them, and they brought them back and were pulling dead Hodges off the Humvees and piling them up in the, on the side of the road next to us. And then we had to wait for other trucks to come out of TQ and take those dead insurgents away. Anyway, by the time we got back to Anaconda, it had been 70 hours since I had gone to sleep. So on our logbook week, when we were supposed to keep logbooks and work 70 hours a week, I worked 130 without with, during that week. So, yeah, we worked long hours. Wow. Sam, I, I want to stop you for a second. And I just want to tell you, dude, like, I'm sitting here thinking of how much of a wimp I am. Like, no <laughs> jokes, man. Like, I, I drive LTL. I'm home every night. And at the end of my day, sometimes I'm driving home and I'm like, man, I'm so tired. Dude, 70 hours straight? I didn't, like, most people listening to that right now can't even fathom that their body could do something like that. Is that is this something that you kind of worked up to over time? Or is this something that you just were, it's like baptism by fire and you just physically do what you have to do just to stay alive? There, there was no working up to it. <clears throat> you just, and it wasn't that way all the time. There were several missions where you would go 24 hours without sleeping. But that, that mission where I went 70 hours without sleeping and worked 130 in the week was was on the high end we didn't that was the only time that happened but you know 100 100 hour weeks 120 hour weeks and going without sleep for 24 30 hours that was that was pretty common and and you just you got used to it you found ways to stay awake you'd see guys walking around with black eyes because they were punching themselves in the face to stay awake while they're out on on convoy and all the MREs were open and all the, all the coffee was gone because guys had just uh, snorted or, or chew it like tobacco, just trying to stay awake. It was, and it, and it became normal. That's just the way we lived. That it wasn't, we didn't say, oh, that this sucks. That just was the way it was. We got used to it and that's the way it was. That's incredible, man. That's absolutely incredible. And it's like, literally, I'm sitting here listening to you talk about this. And part of me is like, I didn't, I don't even think I ever thought about if it's even humanly possible to stay awake that long. You know, like when I'm driving down the highway and stuff at the end of the day, and even in my rig, like sometimes like your, your eyes are getting heavy. And that's just after a freaking, you know, 12, 14 hour day. Like, yeah. man, I honestly, I think we said it before, and I'll say it again. I tip my hat off to you, man. Mm -hmm. This is this is some heavy stuff. You know, one of the things is, is fascinating to me, and I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about this, is uh, I'm 52, and I have never heard these stories before. I used to I used to watch the news all the time. I remember when 9-11 happened. I remember all the things that were going on when we talked incessantly. And not that, not that it was undue talk, but it was, you know, we heard about the, what the army was going through, what the Marines were going through, what, you know, the different branches of the service and, and all, all very, very much so due to them. It, you know, the, all their due is, is given to them. But to hear what the civilian contractors were going through to, to actually get a feel for what you guys were experiencing is just it's phenomenal. And, and I'm sitting here asking myself, why haven't I ever heard this on the news? Why haven't I ever heard these things before? Because, I mean, here's a guy who is, is a civilian who's over there doing his job and signing up as a volunteer to do this. And it, it's fascinating to me. And at the same time, it's heartbreaking to me that we have not heard these things from our own news services, that, that we have people who are sacrificing themselves. Well, and, that's, and that was one of the reasons why I, I wanted to come and talk. Um, because you might, you might have a friend or... There's somebody that says, hey, I, yeah, I drove truck in Iraq, but but nobody knows what that means unless you were over there. So I think the more I can share these stories and and make people aware of what happened, then maybe when your friend says, I, I drove truck in Iraq, you'll 
have more of a feel what that means and, and have a little more respect for them when they say that. Most definitely. And I am so glad that you have come on it. You, you contacted Tony, you contacted us to, to actually come on and talk about these things because it's great to bring this stuff to light. And I, I, I am, I'm really appreciative of you being here and sharing these things with us and walking back through these things and, and sharing the experience because we need to know this. We need to hear this. Yeah, there was, there was, a the, the number of civilians that worked in Iraq was, almost as many if not as many as the military that was over there and i know that not to take anything away from the military because they did a hard job and i i love those guys they i owe my life to them but i don't know if you remember if you'd watch the news on back when we were in iraq you would see the body count they'd always have the body count and they'd use that to beat up president bush saying you know we're closing in on 2,000 soldiers have been killed in Iraq, and they'd, they'd have the counting that down, you know? Yep, yep. We, we always knew when the, uh, when the press back home, when the media was beating up the president over the body count, because less and less military would go outside, and more and more civilians would, because nobody kept track of how many civilians were dying. So when when it got in the media how many soldiers were dying and they'd keep track of it, then they would send more and more civilians and less military outside the wire because that way they could keep that number down. Sure. Yeah. And your, your numbers were easier to hide than, than the amount of uh, servicemen and women. Correct. It's, it's just fascinating. It is just fascinating to me. So I, can... I didn't mean to interrupt you, so you please yeah, go right ahead. Okay. So I, I was there, I worked for about a year with Anaconda bulk fuel. And then they put together a special convoy that would, the military was rotating out. So we had to take all the military equipment all through Iraq and take it to Kuwait and then bring the new units equipment up and and deliver it to the bases where they were going to be at. So I got picked with 21 other guys to be on a convoy doing that. So we were all assigned our own trucks. That was the only time over there that I had my own truck. And we were all flatbeds. And we would go to bases all over Iraq, and we would load up the equipment that was shipping home. And then when we got to Kuwait City, we would load up the other equipment the new equipment that was coming in country and we would deliver it to whatever base it had to go to. And we, every, almost every day, well, two or three times a week, we would have to go over a bypass around Baghdad. And those roads were called force and sword. And it was a bypass to keep us out of Baghdad. And those at that time were the most dangerous roads in Iraq. They were probably the most dangerous roads in the world. I remember on a, there was an intersection there called Alpha 59. And we would come under the freeway, make a big turn to the freeway above us. And then we were on force. And I remember seeing a whole convoy of 20 trucks burned to the ground on on that intersection and we would we were on that road two or three times every week when we were on the special convoy going to Kuwait. So one night <clears throat> we always knew when that turn was coming up if we were headed north because there was a little footbridge that we would pass right before that turn and on the special convoy, I was always truck number 20 because the bobtail told me, he said, I know that you'll never leave me behind. I want you to be truck number 20 in case something happens. I know that you won't leave me. So the whole time we did that, I was the very last truck in the convoy. And we were cruising up towards Alpha 59, the intersection. And we got there. I knew it was getting close, but the when you get a convoy stretched out, you're, you know, the lead truck's two miles in front of you. So 
I knew we were getting close. I thought they should have made that turn. And at that time, I looked over and saw that little footbridge that we always looked for. And it had been blown up and pushed to the side of the road. And everybody in the convoy had missed it. So we missed that whole turn. And I called the convoy commander. I said, hey, this is tough. I just passed the, I just passed the turn. And the whole convoy went quiet. You could feel the tension because that was the most dangerous place in Iraq. And now we had two miles of convoy in the city that had all missed that turn. And we stopped immediately. We were on a four lane road, but we, there was a two foot cement barrier between the, the northbound and the southbound lane. So we, we couldn't turn around unless we went over that barrier and we were loaded heavy. And <clears throat> that's the most scared I ever was in Iraq when I realized we missed that turn and that we were all inside the city. All the lights started shutting off around us. You can see people running out of their houses to get weapons, we, we assumed. And I heard somebody next to me say, what happens next is going to determine if you live or die and all your friends. And it was such a real voice that I even looked over to see who was next to me, but the seat was empty. And then something that I can't explain happened. And I was outside of my body and I was above my truck and I could look to the front of the convoy and I could see my friends that were two miles in front of me. I could look down the street and I could see the Iraqis running with, with their AKs and one with the RPG running towards us because they were going to wipe us out. And I heard the convoy commander say, lock in your axles. We got to jump this cement barrier and get turned around. And I, I actually watched his driver, who was two miles in front of me, reach up and lock in his differentials. And then the truck started hitting that curb, trying to get over it. And there's no way in a million tries that 20 trucks could hit that curb and go over it without getting landing gear hung up or blowing tires out. But that night we did. I, from above my truck, I watched my body lock in the differentials, hit that barrier. And I saw my body being thrown back and forth, almost out of the seat because it was such a huge chunk of cement that we were jumping over but i didn't feel anything because i wasn't i wasn't there i was above my truck watching it all we all got turned around just a small arm started hitting the trucks and guys started calling out bullet <clears throat> hits on their trucks from the small arms and now that all those trucks had turned around i was in the front and i the convoy commander yelled tough get us out of here and from above my truck i could look and i could see a clear path it was like it was illuminated for it for me to see and i took all those trucks off out of that kill zone and followed that illuminated path back onto sword and took them to a low base called kaji and we stopped there and and regrouped and Right after I got those trucks all turned around and and everybody safe, I was back in inside my body, which was shaken so bad from all the adrenaline that dumped into it that that I, I it was hard to drive just from all the adrenaline that been dumped into my body. But every one of us knew that we should have all been dead, and the only reason we were all alive is because we had help that night. All of us knew that. There wasn't one guy that doubted that we'd been helped that night, and that's how we got out of there. So that was a little paranormal experience that I had over there that I can't explain except that God was watching out for us, and he helped us that night. That is one of the most intense 
incredible, heartfelt stories I have ever heard in all the years that I've been podcasting. Sam, I cannot even fathom this experience. I don't, I honestly, I'm sitting here hearing your story and I'm trying to imagine what you were going through. And the only feeling I'm getting is the same feeling of when I'm watching something like this in a movie. I literally feel like I'm in the theaters right now watching a movie, only this is real life. This actually happened to you. I cannot believe what I just heard. You're telling me that this happened to you guys. You got kind of turned turned upside down. You hear a voice basically give you the, the blueprint of saying what you're about to do or your next decisions is going to determine whether you all live or die. And then you have an out-of-body experience where you see your own body and you see the whole convoy. And you're able to direct people because of this out-of-body experience. That's what I heard, right? That's exactly what happened. I remember very vividly. So the trucks in front of us, or the trucks in front of me, because I was the very last truck, they were two miles into the city already. And I remember, I don't know how I can explain it, but I watched my best friend in the second truck, so he would have been almost two miles in front of me. I watched him turn his differentials in, rev his engine as high, you know, over rev his engine to get as much power as he could and then jumped over that divider. And I remember in that moment how relieved I was that my best friend had just made it over that. And I, I can't explain that. He was too far away to even see. But I watched him. I watched him do that. Let me ask you a question. You're having this out-of-body experience. You've had an experience that most people in the world never have. What was that like in that moment? Were you conscious of what was happening around you that you were having an out-of-body experience or is it something looking back that you realized you had an out-of-body experience that saved you and all the other men because when i hear people talk about these things i often wonder if it's like your spirit leaving your body or do you think it's something totally different well i don't know the i don't know the psychology or the science behind it tony but i felt like my spirit left my body and one of the reasons I feel that way is because of the, when I, when I realized we'd all pass our turn, it felt like cold fingers grabbed my guts and started twisting them inside. It was the most scared I've ever been. I mean, you hear about people say, oh, that, I watched a movie and it was scary. That, that's not fear. Fear is your guts being twisted inside you. It felt like with icy fingers. And as soon as I was above my truck and out of my body, that feeling was gone. All that was gone. So I, I couldn't feel any of that. Like I said, my body was prone almost out of the seat of my truck as it went over the cement barrier. But I, I didn't feel any of that. I was watching it from above, looking at it and watching all the other guys in the convoy. I knew everything that was happening everything around me in a 360 degree radius i could see the iraqis coming out of houses i could see guys uh running down the street with the with the belt fed machine gun i saw another guy climbing stairs in a building with the rpg and i saw all that everything i don't, I don't know how it happened but it, but that's what happened so in that moment from what I'm, I'm trying to understand um what it was like looking back at it is it almost as if you are 
ha- like you like in your spirit body or whatever it was that was the out of body experience that you had is it almost like you're uh with an rc car where you're controlling something almost like a drone like is that kind of like how it was like your body your physical body was still moving and doing what your spirit body your out of body experience was telling you to do is that kind of what you're saying no i i was above my truck and my body was i watched my truck being driven by myself and i wasn't telling it what to do i was aware of everything else that was happening around us i wasn't i wasn't telling it what to do maybe it was all muscle memory you know from just acting on its own but I wasn't like an RC car telling it what to do. It just, I was watching it do what it needed to do to get out of there. So it was almost like, and I'm sorry if I'm not describing this right, but it's almost as if then there was two consciousness at one time simultaneously. There was the, the spirit being, and then there was the physical body that was still doing and making decisions on its own, right? I guess you could explain it that way. I've, I've never thought about that, how that all happened. I, I just uh, attributed it to when I, when I left, I'm a real religious person and, and not just go to church every day. I believe that God is interested in us and he'll help us if we ask him to. And before I left, I got a blessing, and in that blessing, uh, a man put his hands on my head and blessed me that I would return home to see my wife, and I never doubted that the whole time I was there. I believe that's why I was saved when, when my truck got blown up with another driver in it. I believe that's what saved me in that moment, and I believe that saved me other times when I was over there as well, probably times that I don't even know, but I know that God, for some reason, was watching me, and and he saved my life several times when I was over there, and not just me, that there's a hundred other guys with stories just like mine, like I said before, I, I don't think that what I experienced is anything out of the ordinary from what everybody experienced over there. I understand what you're saying, man. I really do. And it's just, when I sat down to talk to you, I did not even realize the depth that we were going to go today. And this is just, I don't even know, I, I'm, I'm literally lost for words because I feel like any word I say to describe how I feel is undercutting the true immensity that I feel inside right now. And I, I just want to say right now that I 100% appreciate you coming forward and sharing this information so that the world knows what happens over there. Because we often think about the military being over there and we, we care about our military. We don't think about civilian contractors because we don't hear about it. And you're doing a great service right now sharing these experiences with the world thank you i believe tony that the reason you you're at a loss of words i i believe that was a spiritual experience and and it's hard to describe in a, a spiritual experience we we can't you know our earthly forms and who we are it's hard to describe the spiritual stuff that happens to us sometimes and that's that's what that was that was a spiritual experience I couldn't agree 100% more. Yeah, most definitely. So, Sam, where do we go from here, man? <laughs> so, <clears throat> we were on our, our Kuwait convoy, hauling equipment to Kuwait and back into Iraq. And we would stop at a base that was south of Baghdad, kind of between Baghdad and the Kuwait border. And they built this base right on right in the middle of the over the top of the freeway, so any local traffic had to go around, and we would pull in there, and they had twenty fuel pumps, so we could 
pull in there as a convoy, load all 20 trucks, and be gone out the other side in, in 15 minutes. But one night, I we were pulling out of that base, and the Jersey barriers, there's Jersey barriers at the entrances, there's Tesco barriers, which are big um cloth bags they fill with dirt and then they're in a wire frame and that that protects the people inside and then they have tea walls which are great big cement walls anyway we were weaving out of this base entrance to get back on the freeway and somebody threw a grenade over the top of the tea wall and it landed on the back of my truck and exploded and that was no big deal I just wanted to keep rolling. I didn't even call it up and say anything, but we learned later that was a diversion because a a V bed came bouncing through the desert towards the front of our convoy. That's a vehicle borne explosive device, a car bomb and car bombs don't, they aren't like you see on TV. It's not one, one guy who wants to die for all of, there's a guy who's, been convinced either by drugging him or threatening his family to get in the car and then they tape his hands to the steering wheel in case he changes his mind and then there's always another car behind him which has the trigger that blows him up so we saw these two cars hauling butt out of the desert towards the front of our convoy and this grenade that had gone off was just a a diversion to draw our attention away well up on Each side of that gate was two soldiers with 50 caliber Maduses, the big belt fed 50 caliber guns. And they swung those guns over and started shooting at those cars in the desert. And they, they didn't disable them. They were quite a ways away, but they turned them. So they, they took off back out through the desert. And then these two, yahoos that had thrown the grenade over they jumped in a toyota pickup and and just started hauling butt away from us to trying to get away well those two soldiers saw that toyota pickup and swung those guns over and i it's hard to describe the power in a 50 caliber like that but they started hitting that truck and it looked like somebody dropped the 10 tons of gravel on top of that truck. It was going 60 miles an hour through the desert, and then it just stopped and hit the ground. And chunks were flying off of it, and not little chunks either, but big chunks like the motor flying out the front. I don't even know what happened to the guys inside of it. They were just disintegrated, I guess. But the hood flying, you know, 30 yards out in the desert, it was impressive to see what those, what those, big machine guns did to a regular car and it it's not like the movies you it's it's pretty impressive there's no no coming back from something like that well one day we were on that same stretch of road we'd just gone through scania and we're coming north and we we were all quiet you know just cruising through the night we're just past abu Ghraib where the Soldiers got in trouble for taking pictures of the prisoners and stuff. That was all over the news. But we just passed Abu Ghraib, and the lead truck, the little green flare went over the front of the truck. And our convoy commander in the front truck, he said, get ready, guys. They just marked the front of the convoy. And then I was in the back, and I saw a little red flare fly over the top of my truck. And... And I had time to pick up the mic and say they marked the back, here it comes. And right then the whole, that was the most coordinated attack I, I'd seen on a convoy. They weren't just spraying and praying like they usually did. They had us dead to rights. And they opened up <clears throat> maybe 30 guys spread out on that freeway. But in the muzzle flashes, you could see the silhouettes of six strikers and strikers are a eight wheel combat vehicle that the military would use over there. And somehow they found these guys 
with their with their night vision. They'd seen these guys laying a trap for us and moved in there real quiet and just waited for them to start the show. And as soon as those they sprung their ambush, those strikers, every time you saw a muzzle flash, those strikers just in in a second they were they took them out. And it didn't take five seconds for them to take out that whole ambush. And I've never been so proud of the military as I was that night. They they owned the night over there. And we again owed our owed our lives and our safety to those guys that were out there just doing a job and they they did it really well. Well I came <clears throat> I went to Missoula. I got transferred to Missoula and which is in northern Iraq, which was a little bit different. The way they drove was a little bit different. It wasn't we weren't getting hit every single time we went outside the wire like like we were when we were hauling fuel, but I remember one mission, me and a really good friend of mine named Ghost, we were in the back two trucks and we transferred up there together. So we were the new guys again and they put us in the very back of the convoy and they were running warlocks, which is a, they would set off IEDs, the Iraqis would with the cell phones or with the, with the electronic devices and these warlocks was a device they put on the Humvee and it would block all radio or electronic transmissions in a radius around the whole convoy. So my friend Ghost was behind me and he had that real dog of a truck. He couldn't keep up. And this is our first mission in Missoula, so we don't even know where we're going. And I was real worried that Ghost was getting, that we were going to lose him. So I kept dropping farther back. And I couldn't call the convoy commander and tell him because of the warlock was jamming all of our transmissions. And I always carried a, a bug out bag and I always had a bunch of uh, chem lights in it, which I never used, but I always, I always kept like 50 of them in that bug out bag. And <clears throat> we, we were dropping farther and farther behind. I was dropping behind because I was trying to keep Ghost in sight in my rear view mirror. And the truck in front of me tried to keep him in sight so that I could see where he turned. And then every time we turned, I'd throw out a handful of chem lights, hoping that my friend would figure out what I was doing and, and make those turns. Well, I was <clears throat> watching for him in the rear view mirror. And I looked up and saw a tank mine. We called them tank killers. And they looked like the bottom five inches of a five gallon bucket if you cut it out. But they would put those in the road and they were to they would disable the M one's Abrams. And we'd we'd had trucks hit them but there was nothing left. I saw the cab blown off a truck in twenty yards out in the desert after it got hit by one of these. And I watched that disappear under the driver's side tire of my truck. It felt like a speed bump when I hit it. And in that moment, I knew I was dead. And then I felt the drivers bounce over it. And then I felt the trailer tires bounce over it. And it was, it was the happiest I've ever been in my life to know that I just drove over that tank killer with all the driver's side tires on my truck and I was still alive. I couldn't, I knew I was dead. And that was the, you can't even describe that feeling when that happened. So I threw out a handful of cam lights to let my buddy know that there was something in the road there. And anyway, we got back to base. We left his truck there because it was such a dog it needed work done. And he rode back with me. He told me later, he said, yeah, I, I figured out what you're doing. I knew you were throwing those lights for me. And we rode back to base together. He rode with me in my truck, but we had to stop along the way so that EOD could blow up that tank mine that I just drove over. 
And we were there watching them. They got their little robot with the C4 and drove it up to this tank mine. And the vibration of that robot driving up to the tank mine set off that mine and, and blew up the robot and destroyed it. And I just drove in a 80,000 pound truck over that tank mine with all the tires on the passenger side, hitting it like a huge speed bump and it didn't go off. And it went off when that little robot was driving up there to put a C4 charge on it. So wow. another, another instance of, of being saved by, by something that I can't explain. But like I said, that stuff happened all the time. Happened all the time while we were over there. It just sounds like the Lord really had his hands on you while you were there. And it is, I mean, it's, it's fantastic to hear the stories. And it, it, it is just amazing. It is just amazing. Well, and I, and I wasn't the only one. There was a guy, people knew that I'd, I'd been on a religious mission in South America when I was younger. And they would always ask me to pray before we went on convoys. And one day a guy came up to me. I didn't know him real well, but he, he said that he knew he was going to die. He had that feeling that he was going to, something bad was going to happen to him. And, and that's real. People will, will feel that and then something will happen to him. But he, he told, he was really worried. He, he had debt at home that he couldn't go back to. He was over there doing this for his family. And so he didn't want to go back to the situation at home without making enough money to fix it. But he, he really felt like something bad was going to happen to him. And he came to me with another driver and we talked to him and, and I, we asked him if he knew about fasting and he said, no, he didn't. So we, we taught him about fasting. The other guy he came with was, was a Christian too, believed in, in that stuff, had a, had a faith in it. So we, we taught him about fasting and we promised him that we would start a fast with him right then for his safety. And we did that. We, we committed to, starting to fast, prayed with him. And that guy went out on his next mission and they'd hung a one five five artillery round under a overpass and it went off on his truck. And there was holes big enough that you could look through the cab of his truck and out the other side. The whole side of his truck had shrapnel holes through it. There was shrapnel holes through the driver's seat of his truck. And he had not a scratch on him. They hauled that truck back to base and put it in our our pile of blown up trucks, which was getting pretty significant by then. And everybody that walked past it could not believe that that guy survived, not only survived, but survived without a scratch after they looked at his truck. And that stuff, that stuff just happened. I believe that War like that brings out the worst of people, but I've always liked reading about it and the history and stuff because it always brings out the best too. And that's when you can see the hand of of the Lord helping people when they really need it too. Yes, you got that right. So, well, that... <clears throat> go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say after. Being in Missoula for a little bit, I a couple months there, I I really started wanting to go home. I'd been there long enough, and I did go home, but I'd changed so much that I couldn't be around people. I couldn't feel comfortable when I was at home. Uh, I couldn't believe that people cared about stuff like what car they drove or what kind of clothes they wore. It was a whole, it was like being on another planet. And I went to Wyoming and worked in the oil fields, driving truck for a few months, which was better because I wasn't around people all the time, but I still 
if we had to, you know, when you're driving, you have to let cars pass down the right. We never let anybody pass us on the right in Iraq because we always kept cars on our passenger side. That way, if they blew up or shot into your truck, it had to go through the whole truck before it could get to you. And every time somebody passed me on the, or I'm sorry, on the left, passed me on the left, I, I, I was an emotional wreck. I was in, in survival mode all the time. And I couldn't, I couldn't adjust to being home. The only place I wanted to be in was a rack with my, with my brothers. So I finally called up the recruiter and they immediately sent me back to Iraq. It had been almost eight months since I'd been there and it changed so much that I didn't feel comfortable there anymore where we had run and as hard and fast as we could all the time that was our defense was to go as hard and fast as we could now they were using a a shape charge which looked like a four foot length of pipe that a plumbing pipe would be in your house and that would shoot a, a stream of molten copper through the truck so we had armored trucks then by then but these shape charges would defeat it and then and they'd lay them on the side of the road pointed up at our truck so the only way to defeat those was to drive 20 miles an hour and spot them before they went off on the convoy so that was i was in a i i was in a position where i didn't belong anywhere in the world because what i lived in Iraq and what I wanted to get back to was gone. It didn't exist and it, it would never exist again. It was just a two or three years that I experienced over there. And I tried to go back to it and I couldn't. And I know I didn't belong here in the States and I didn't belong there anymore. And I, it was, a, uh, I didn't know it then, but that was the PTSD that I was experiencing from everything that happened. I, would have nightmares at night, wake up. My wife was afraid to sleep in the same bed with me for quite a while when I got back. And I I was at the point of a breakdown. So I came back home and it would get so bad that I, I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't be around people. And I... I was saved one more time. The Lord didn't just save me over there. He saved me one more time when he sent my uncle to my house and he prayed with me and blessed me. And that didn't fix me immediately. But from that point on, things started getting better. And I went and talked to a counselor and he told me, he said, you, you have the worst PTSD that I've ever seen anybody have he said i don't know how you are living with yourself without being an alcoholic or or a drug addict and as soon as he told me that i had ptsd my mind had a reason for the way i was feeling and what i was going through and it started to heal itself is how i describe it as soon as i knew what it was and that i just wasn't crazy i started to get better and just this summer, it's been 11 years since I've been over there. And I went to church with my wife and I got home and I realized I just sat through all the meetings at church without wondering if somebody was going to come in the door and, and try to kill me. And that took 11 years before that happened. And I just want to, I know I'm not the only person that feels that way. And if I can share a message with anybody, it's the, that you're not the only one. All of us that were over there have experienced those things. And, and we need to get help for it because that, that really helped me to get help for it, both spiritually and, and psychologically going to a, a counselor that could help me work through that stuff. Yeah. Sam, I tell you, man, 
your story is it's one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard. And I know you weren't registered in the military, but you served our country just like the military did. Amen to that. And Thank you. it's it's an honor to talk to you. And I I really just from the bottom of my heart want to say thank you for what you did because you're hauling fuel every day. That's a bomb waiting to happen in itself. And all the things you've been through, man, like you hauling fuel is the least of your worries. <laughs> and and I, I just, man. And to hear that you made it out the way you did. And, you know, it clearly, I mean, from this side, looking at your story, it's no wonder you had PTSD. It, it's not even a shocker. If you told me, if somebody told me just real quick, hey, I know a guy that went through this, that, and the other, and these are experiences, you know, five minute synopsis, I would say that guy has PTSD, no doubt in my mind. And so the fact that you were able to get help and get it diagnosed, and just the fact that you understood you had PTSD, and that started the healing process because you just knew that you weren't crazy now. Right. That, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And I, I really just commend you for one, having the bravery and the the wherewithal to go ahead and follow through on this idea of going over there to serve our country in the way you did. And then to follow through on three years when you signed a contract for one and to come through all the way through with the PTSD to now where you were able to sit through a church service and the meetings and not worry about if somebody's going to come in and kill you 11 years later. The healing process that you have gone through psychologically and within your own heart, it's a miracle, man. It's true. Your life is truly a miracle. Because like the, the doctor said to you, he has never seen anybody with that kind of PTSD. And he couldn't believe you weren't a drug addict or an alcoholic. Yeah. Man, listen, God protected you over there and he protected you here with the PTSD until you got that thing figured out. Like God's hand on your life has been there and it is absolutely an amazing journey you've been on. And I really do hope, just like you said, that you sharing these stories and sharing what happened over there allows other people that had similar experiences to know and understand that healing is available. Healing is real and it's possible because you're living proof. And yeah. man, Sam, thank you so much for sharing these stories. You're welcome, Tony. That that was a. Uh, I shared them with family and friends, and and I kind of feel like you're my family. I watch you interact with people, and you're like, I feel like you're one of my brothers. <laughs> I don't know if that <laughs> sounds crazy or not, but we treat not each other right. just the way you do with your brother and and stuff. And when and I feel comfortable. I I wouldn't share them with anybody, but I respect you. I. You're a good person, and I I feel good sharing these stories with you, and I know you'll get them out to people that, that will be helped by it. So, Well, Sam, this show is a show where drivers are sharing their stories uh, so other drivers can relate and you know be entertained while they're out in the roads. This story, I will not be surprised if I get emails saying I had to pull over to listen to this guy because... <laughs> I'm telling you, man, you probably put a lot of trucks at rest stops tonight. Yep. Honestly. <laughs> yes. Well, that's, I, that's a good thing, I guess. <laughs> Everything you just said for the last hour and a half is a good thing. Yep. And let me just say to anybody else out there who's been over there, thank you. Thank you to Sam and thank you to everyone who has done that job because that is an amazing job and it is a tough job. And what you, what you experience, Sam, is phenomenal. The Lord's hand in your life, working and moving in you, is, is just an amazing thing. It is amazing to see the Lord work in people's lives. And I know this isn't a show about the Lord. I'm not making it that. But, <laughs> but it is amazing to see the Lord work in people's lives. And, uh, and hearing your story, it is, it is just phenomenal. It is just phenomenal. And it, you, you paint the picture. You literally painted a picture for people to see 
the experience through your eyes, the the out of body experience that you painted for people to see, what you went through, what you were doing, what was going on. I, I was literally on the edge of my seat listening to this. And I agree with Tony, there are gonna be a lot of people who are gonna pull over to listen to this story because it is amazing. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing it with us because we are blessed because you have shared this with us. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you and it's, it's been an honor. Well, that's the show, everybody. We really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. We don't care where you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it, because that is the best thing you can do to help the show grow. Now, if you want to see some pictures of Sam's experiences in Iraq, he sent us some of the pictures, including some wood sticking out of a windshield and sniper bullets in his truck. So go ahead to the hammerlanelegends.com to check out those pictures on the show's description. parked through over the driver's door, ran out the side of the car, across the front of it, and jumped right off the side of the bridge in front of me. The only people who really pulled over were truckers. He said, we're going to Hodge, and he didn't slow down. He went across the median onto the oncoming traffic, but where they could see him coming, they just got out of the way. I noticed this plane was really low. He went right in front of us, hit the fence, and it spun around. You know, 30 seconds more, he could have hit us. And I went around that truck, and a guy stepped out from behind the truck and threw a piece of wood, and it shot through my window just like a spear and stuck in the back of the cab of my truck. That's probably one of the stranger things I've seen. 